So try to figure out um, under which condition uh, rationing unemployment is positive in the model with job rationing. Um, and because um, it doesn't have to be. There are certain situations where rationing unemployment is zero and then certain situations where rationing unemployment is positive, which means there are certain situations in which jo jobs are not lacking and certain situations in which jobs are lacking in, uh, in the economy. So we're trying to figure out when is <coughs> rationing unemployment which will denote it you are positive. And um, that's pretty easy. Um, so you are is positive, so there is a lack of a job when uh, basically the labor demand at theta is equal to zero. So which is the labor demand when recruiting is costless for firms. We know that when theta is equal to zero, the tightness is zero, vacancies are, are filled immediately. It's as if recruiting costs were zero for the firm. So, uh, you know, it's the intercept with the x-axis. So when the labor demand at theta is equal to zero, is less than the size of the labor force. When that's the case, it means that even when recruiting is free, firms don't want to hire and everybody there is rationing an employment. Okay? So now if we use our expressions, so that's when uh, so now we can use the expression for the labor demand when theta is equal to zero. So that's going to be that's when alpha a 1 minus gamma omega 1 over 1 minus alpha is less than h. Now we can rewrite that. That's very easy to rewrite it as follows. <clears throat> so we can write this as uh, omega alpha a 1 minus gamma is uh, strictly so I'm going to invert so first I'm going to invert the two sides of the equation they are both positive numbers once I invert them I can flip the sign of the inequality and then once this is inverted I can put everything in the power of alpha minus 1. So what I've done, I've done two things. First I've inverted both sides of the equation um, and, then, and then I've multiplied both sides by 1 minus alpha. So on the left hand side, once it's inverted and, and put to the power of 1 minus alpha, I get just omega divided by alpha a 1 minus gamma. On the other side, once h is inverted, I get 1 over h. Once I put it to the power of 1 minus alpha, I get 1 over h to the power of 1 minus alpha. That's just the same as h to the power of alpha minus 1. Okay? So this is what we get here. Now I can just reshuffle this a little bit. I can write this as omega. <coughs> a gamma, so if I bring the a gamma from the denominator to the numerator, is strictly more than alpha. I bring that from the other side of the equation, times a times h alpha minus 1. But this you recognize omega times a to the power of gamma, that's just the wage. And alpha a h to the power of alpha minus 1, that's just the marginal product of labor when employment, uh, when the level of employment is h. So this is just the marginal product of labor of uh, the last worker in the labor force, you know, the least productive worker in the labor force. Because you know, you have diminishing, through a concave production function, you have diminishing 
marginal returns to labor. So as you add workers, they are less and less and less productive. The least productive worker is the last worker to enter the H worker. Okay, so that's our condition. When the wage, when the wage is just given uh, by this function of productivity, is more than the marginal product of the last worker in the labor force, then we are going to see some job rationing. And the logic is very simple. It's just saying that if for the least productive worker in the labor force, the wage that you have to pay them is above their marginal product, then for sure no firms want to hire them. Because in addition, you also have to recruit them, which is costly. But put that aside, if their wage that you have to pay them doesn't, you know, if, if, their, pro if their productivity is lower than their wage, it means you always have to pay them more than the profit you're going to make off of these workers. So then for sure no firms want to hire them. And then we know that there is a job rationing here. Because of some workers, in that case, are less productive than, than they are paid. Okay, and that's why the job rationing. So essentially here, job rationing arises because in any situation in which the wage is too high. Okay, so here the story for job rationing is really a story about wages not being in sync with uh, productivity. So if you go back a little bit to kind of um, old ideas about unemployment, here you know, what we have is something akin to what was used to be called classical unemployment. The story that the reason why job rationing arises is something that looks like classical unemployment. That is, that's an unemployment um, caused by wages being too high. And it's something that Keynes, for instance, talk, talked about, but a lot of people were talking about that, um, you know, after, you know, I guess, early in the 20th century, all the way to the 60s and 70s, that was kind of something that was well known, this concept of classical unemployment. So here, in what we see, that's exactly what we see here. It's a type of unemployment that causes job rationing, it's something that was called you know, classical unemployment. But, you know, um, what's important is to know that here the source of this job rationing is that wages are too high. That's really the key conceptual idea here. And so, um, let's say, I, you know, I just take any wage function of the form that I've assumed here, omega times a to the power of gamma, do I know that for some level of productivity, I'll be sure that there is some uh, job rationing? Pay or not? And the answer is yes. Given the form of the uh, wage function, we are guaranteed that when productivity is low enough, there will be some job rationing. So let's, uh, let's see that. Let's see how that's the case. So here we have guarantees that when productivity is low enough, job rationing will appear. And 
and in which case the rationing and employment is strictly positive. How do we know that? Well, let's go back to our condition for um, job rationing. Right, so the, we can take this condition, the condition that the wage is, uh, is more than uh, the marginal product of labor. So let's rewrite this. So job rationing appears when the wage, which is omega and gamma, is more than the marginal product of the last worker in the labor force, which is alpha a h alpha minus one. Okay. So now if I reshuffle the terms, it's when omega divided by alpha h one minus alpha. So here I've just put uh, alpha and h, alpha minus 1 on the other side is strictly greater than a1 minus gamma. But then I can take both sides to the power of 1 over 1 minus gamma, which is a positive exponent, so it doesn't change inequality. And so here we see there is a threshold actually of productivity that leads to job rationing. Uh, okay, and mind you, omega, alpha, h1 minus alpha, these are all positive things. One over one minus gamma, that's positive. So this is just some this is just a positive threshold that we can call a, a positive. Okay, so this is a threshold for labor productivity. And below which there is job rationing. So now that we've seen what happens uh, in the model when the working cost goes to the one? In particular, we've seen that unemployment doesn't disappear, so that we have some job rationing in the model. When uh, the working cost goes to zero, there is still, you know, when productivity is low enough, or if you want, when wages are high enough, uh, there is an amount of workers that firms will never want to hire, despite the fact that we're putting three, so there is some job rationing. Um, now what we can